So what you just read, it's, it's from the very beginning of the book, works as an overture for what, what's going to follow in, in, in the rest of the memoir. And um, by that, what I mean is that if you read it, uh, you'll now have an expectation of the people who will figure largely in your childhood, uh, in your coming of age. These, these folks will have an outsized role. Um, but I think what makes the book so compelling is that to this, if you will, the skeleton of the story are all these things around it of just life, things that happen to us, things along the way. Um, there are, uh, uh, you evoke certain eras, you evoke certain times, you, uh, and particularly one of them is uh, San Francisco. Um, reading your passages on San Francisco in the 70s, uh, I couldn't help but think of Mal Ernst and Malpin's Tales of the City. And so what I wanted to ask you was, how much research do you have to do to evoke that particular time? Because many of the things you, you describe, many of the places are gone. God bless you for the research question, zero. Uh, <laughs> and it's the only time I've ever been to answer a question about research with no, nothing, really. So this is just drawing back on what, what, the things on how you remember, but your yeah. memory is pretty damn good, yeah. I have to say. Yeah, yeah. No, I, well, I think my memory was a weapon. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in chaos in a lot of ways, and being, you know, I became a writer in part because I needed to set the story straight. Uh, and my urge was consistently to notice everything and try to be as uh, much of a recorder as possible. And this is the San Francisco of, of Bohemianism. It's a place where essentially, I think at one point, um, the man we know as Peter Charming says, no judgments. <laughs> and this sort of opens up a question of saying, well, this it seems like a, like a generous ethos, but the idea of no judgments can be problematic. Uh, can't it? Oh yeah, definitely. So um, I grew up in the late 60s in, uh, in Southern California. Um, my dad uh, made, uh, he, he pioneered the use of cassette tape and uh, in one day made five million dollars. Then on another day he lost every penny of and more. Uh, and in between there my parents got divorced and my mom and I moved to San Francisco in 1974. And it was the height of Burn bars and uh, it was a little little bit pre disco very early disco time but like there was we were we were there was a kind of uh, a cafe society at that time um, and we went from uh, bar to cafe to restaurant uh, just uh, meeting people and meeting friends and for a lot of people that was uh, invigorating and I think that for some people there wasn't really enough structure behind it that it was easy to fall and it was also very easy to be taken advantage of. Uh, Peter was uh, many, many different things to many people, and one of them, I, he definitely had a lot of more angles than a geodesic dome, as my uh, <laughs> uncle would say. Uh, and he uh, he took advantage of that kind of idea of, hey, we're all friends here. Uh, I'll help you invest your money. The um, I, I, well, I want to circle back to San Francisco in, in a little bit, because uh, well, actually, let me do this now. You, you you have this lovely passage here about the city that I have uh, ingeniously earmarked. So that, uh, so that you could read You're at the bottom of page 45 here, okay. where you talk about the melancholy of, of, of San Francisco. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind reading from that to the, to the end of its graph of the following page. Sure. Uh, this is my first trip up to San Francisco when I'm 10. Mom asked, do people have jobs here? <laughs> because it didn't seem like anyone, anyone took anything seriously. But it wasn't frivolous. San Francisco ran on melancholy. People here knew San Francisco wasn't what it had been. If only you'd been here a little while ago, that era when things were more festive. The attitude was, we'll play, we'll make life a game. But there's that other time we can't quite put our finger on. That's when you should have been here. Every boutique owner, every bearded street artisan with a booth of hammered silver rings, and every cab driver loved it here. But the love came with sadness. San Francisco forgave that feeling. I know you're sad. Let's all be sad together. There's a, um, thank you. There's a, uh, what I was going to ask you is this. I know you just recently moved down to Los Angeles. And uh, in the past, we've had these sort of conversations before about the city. So, you know, reading that, I, I thought of uh, the thing with the possibility as a San Franciscan. Is this cyclical? Is this just something about the city, the way we perceive it? Or maybe perhaps uh, this time around, uh, did, did we break it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> have, 
we broke in San Francisco. <laughs> well, uh, as a historian, I can tell you we're in 1870 San Francisco right now, which sucked. Um, <laughs> You know, it's unbridled capital, um, that, uh, and there's now a death of consequence for your actions. You can now be insulated from your actions with enough money. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how the pendulum swings again, but, it, you know, either the pendulum is just knocked right out of the clock and we're, we're at the end of some sort of history, or it will swing back again in another 20 years. I mean, I very much hope it's the latter, because uh, I, I, I do miss, you know, I, I am now that you know, nostalgia. I was walking around North Beach, and I'm, I'm now that nostalgia guy going, oh man, you should have been here. In the 70s. Um, uh, the, um, uh, it, it's funny you, you say that because uh, I think the book's about many things, but one of the things I think it's also about is forcing yourself to see what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do a very, very good job yeah. in our lives of constructing narratives, yeah. and we adhere to these narratives no matter what. But we just sometimes cannot see things for what they are. For example, maybe a San Francisco that's no longer the city it might have been, or should have been, or, or our relationships with our parents, or with whomever. But yet, uh, you know, uh, everyone else could see the moat, the log in your eye, shall we say, right? Um, you, you're invisible. Then. That's one thing. Now, writing the book, was this what you sort of set out to examine? Well, um, I've now twice written big historical fiction type books, and I wanted to write something very small uh, that didn't happen, obviously. No, no. Uh, no, not again. <laughs> but uh, I have frequently in my life tried to tell my life story, and each time I've done it as fiction, no one would believe it. There's, a, there's an episode in this book, and this, it's completely true. Um, Ishmael Reed has this brilliant, uh, it's, the, it's a brilliant trap for 19-year-old writers. Uh, the assignment is, when you're in this class, you have to write a story first person from the opposite sex's point of view, which is like 100% failure rate. <laughs> so I went in there, I knew about it, and I Kobayashi maru that fucker. I went in there and I took my mother's letters and I typed them up into a story using her language and everything that was just about what she, about her life. And uh, I turned it in. And there was that really awkward pause in the class where no one said anything. And then finally someone came in and said, uh, clearly this writer's, you know, never met a woman before. Because <laughs> no woman has ever thought this way. Uh, it's a complete failure. Uh, it does not capture the interior of uh, any female character. It just, it's a complete disaster. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, that's one opinion. You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys in class. You know, I need to hear it 30 times. And I did. I, every single person in class agreed. Until the last thing had happened, which is the last person in class said, uh, you know, clearly it's an anti-feminist story. And at this, Ishmael's ears perked up, and he's like, oh, anti-feminist, A-. minus." Um, and the thing is, it's like my mother's life only made sense as satire. Uh, she uh, is a smart woman, uh, compelling, funny, interesting, and makes disastrously bad choices that incrementally got worse over the time of her, uh, of her life. And so... To kind of circle around to what you're saying there, which is that I, I really, I think that I have tried throughout my life to account for what was right before my very eyes. You know, I saw somebody who should not, like, it, after I passed through that phase of I can fix this, I was at the phase of I am a witness to something that I am incapable of describing in fiction. And when I, I was in my 20s, I thought that memoir, you know, Memoir to me was like an admission of failure. It was like, you know, you've admired my paintings, now here are the brushes I used to make them. <laughs> so, I, it took me a long time to kind of get out of that worldview and understand, well, I it was taking a class with Jeffrey Wolf, uh, who wrote The Duke of Deception, who kind of tipped me off to that memoir could be its own art form, that if you, if you really are stuck with these compelling stories that cannot, the reason they're compelling is that they are true. You know, you're not fudging any of the details, and the closer you can actually get in that, you know, fractal way to what actually happened, the more other people seem to be able to get on board with that feeling. It's weird. The more specific you are, the more universal it is. I don't know why. And also, and I should point out too, this is a fantastic memoir about writing. Um, it, it ends as you get in, you start the MFA program in Irvine. Um, but along the way, uh, there's this parallel track of you trying to, let's say, try out 
at being a writer, of doing various things. At one point, you send in a script to Marvel uh, Comics when you're how old? Uh, 12? 12, yeah. 12, and then uh, much like many writers, you get very excited uh, when you uh, hear back from him, yeah. only to realize that what he's saying is, uh, I'm just encouraging you, or I actually don't want the piece, yeah. um, which will become, for anyone who, who tries to do writing for a living, a very uh, recurring uh, <laughs> event. Um, but uh, it, I, I found that part fascinating, and I'll tell you why I found it fascinating, because at the same time, you're trying to figure out these stories yeah. in your life. You're just trying. You're also trying to figure out how to tell them. Yeah. And uh, there was one thing I noticed is that you have, uh, you as a child, you have this ability to notice yourself noticing. And it put me in mind of, of Graham Greene, you know, his his dictum that, you know, this every writer has a splinter of ice in his heart. Huh. And I was wondering, well, what do you think of that? Or my. Uh, oh. Ha. Huh. <laughs> I don't. I. I couldn't have written this with or without my heart. I, I. Like, if I made myself heartless at any point, it would have been flat, or would have been. I would have been judgmental in some way. But the book isn't. But but you are as as a, as a young person. Yeah. Yeah. You seem to be that sort of not even the heartless is sort of detached. Yeah. Well. I guess if that's what he's talking about, the ice, then yeah, no, I was completely detached. But my detached, so I, uh, I, as I watched my mother's decline, I took on a certain amount of detachment because there's nothing I could do to fix it, and there was nothing I could do to run around it and make anything better. But also, I was exposed to it constantly, and as a result, I kind of took, uh, I mean, I took a couple steps back emotionally inside and was a little bit more of an observer than a participant all the way through. And also, you know, my mom wanted to be a writer. Uh, I, I sometimes wonder if she wanted to be, you know, uh, a sculptor or, you know, a banjo player, whether that be what we've been talking about here tonight. Uh, but I, did, I definitely wanted to do what she wanted to do. And uh, I felt that, uh, and, and her, 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 one of the few things that I know that, that, that she showed me was uh, her own life story, um, told from my point of view. Uh, and it was called My Mother's Lovers and Other Reasons I'm Class Valedictorian. <laughs> and, and, like, there's, it, you know, it's, there's some boundaries involved there. Mm. And so, you know, what did I do? Well, I grabbed it and I rewrote it. Uh, from her point of view of my point of view of my point of view on her. <laughs> That's a dissertation. Phew, it's just, it's a therapy session. It's, it's, it's a whole many, many therapy sessions. The, um, uh, the there is that sense throughout the book of, of people being strangers to their feelings, mm -hmm. that you know we, we don't know ourselves. And, if, and I kept thinking, and maybe it's because of the, because of the times right now we're currently living. It's like, where have I heard this before? Where someone is witnessing something awful, where awful things are happening to him, and he say, oh, "This is fine. <laughs> yeah, this yeah, yeah, this is yeah, this is, the, yeah, this is okay. Yeah. yeah, nothing's on fire. Yeah." It's it's not it's just you know what it is it's just something that's happening but for whatever reason it's not affecting you yeah um, did you, was this I mean while you were writing did you think about, or, or maybe not while you were writing but right as it was coming out did you think about you know, that resonance with perhaps our current living under a current administration I uh, wow well, well I, first of all I try I, I try never to do anything contemporary or anything that reflects on what's going on at the moment because you never know if suddenly you're writing like a, a, a savage indictment of the first Clinton administration <laughs> on the back of your head. It's, just, it's, a, it's hard, it, you don't want to keep, you know, I, but I did, what I did know is that uh, that deadness that I sometimes felt inside was something I had to fix as a person first and then as a writer after that. Uh, I think that there's a, uh, uh, you know, I did a lot of therapy and when I was done with therapy I could actually go back in and write novels where characters felt things. It was very hard for me to, uh, um, to figure out that people actually had an emotional interior. I thought that when things got tough, you just floated over everything. I didn't know that was not a, an option. The, uh, I think that you were at Community of Writers. I remember uh, you gave, I think it was a talk on memoir. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I think that's, I remember you saying that do the therapy first, yeah. then do the writing. But there does seem to be, I mean, particularly among uh, people who are starting off writing, the belief somehow is that the writing itself <coughs> to be therapeutic. 
Do you think it is? I, I don't at all. Yeah. No, it's, but, but for some, I think for some folks, there's some of the idea that somehow that in you know, the course of writing these things, there's, there's going to be something out of it that's going to fix you. Yeah. Or that, but I, you know, I don't think that's the case at all, which is why I found what you said so, so interesting. So I, I continuously tried to do the thing that was going to make me a good writer, and I kept on blowing it. And uh, when I was in my mid-twenties, I'd already had a couple of completely finished manuscripts uh, that were no good. Uh, I really tortured my friends with them, especially the one, The Clown Joke. Yes, uh, The Clown Joke. We'll yeah. come back to that. Right. <laughs> uh, God. Sorry, guys. Um, but I had a, uh, I finally, I had this moment where I understood I had mistaken gen clever for genius a lot. Like I, I thought that being clever was the thing to do, and I realized no, that's not it. And uh, I was, I was, I was 26, and uh, my girlfriend at the time was out of town, and I started getting this fever, just this terrible, terrible fever, and I just thought I was going to die from it. I thought, okay, I got to write something. It's got to write something, and. I uh, actually turned out I was getting a fever because I was getting a kidney stone, and it took like four or five days for the kidney stone to pass, and as a result, I was genuinely writing something in a fever, as they talk about, and it got 70,000 words out in six days, and it was, and then the kidney stone came out, and um, it was a recounting of my life at age 12, when I, so when I was 12 and I was at town school, uh, I my, I got a call at, at school, and my mom had moved to New York without telling me. And so when I got home, I was on my own, and so I just wrote about that and everything that happened. And when I was done with it, I thought, okay, this isn't clever, this isn't me trying to impress anyone, this is something I needed to have, and I carried it around. I mean, I remember like, going out to lunch with it and sitting on the table as if it was like another diner. I remember walked into Moe's books and like held it up to the cheese. You know, gonna, <laughs> eventually you'll be there, my friend. <laughs> But, um, and I showed it to my girlfriend and she didn't want to read it. She wasn't interested. She was, she'd already moved on because it showed her so much shitty writing already. And, <laughs> but it, to me, it was this thing where like, okay, this is my evidence of myself as a writer. And then years later, after I got into the UC Irvine Fiction Writing Program, I showed it to my teacher, uh, who handed it back to me and said, I'm sorry, no parent would ever behave this way. Wow. And so what it was, was it was, she, she knew what was going on. She understood. She knew it was 100% autobiographical. But she was being a very good teacher, which is you haven't done the work. It's like, if a writer's job is to make people believe things that are not true, if you can't believe, make them believe something that is true, you're really doing it wrong. Hmm. Uh, so I, it was a message to me to just put that away until I got the skills enough to do it as nonfiction. I mean, and that definitely shows in the book. I think one of the things the book does, and I, I, don't, I, I don't know if this was intentional on your part, but it's, it's one of the rare memoirs I've read where it feels as if a mirror is being held up to the reader. Huh. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you why, because uh, by the time you, know, you get to, 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 to the end, which is to say basically the beginning of your life, really, mm -hmm. um, you feel a sense of conviction. That's to say, you know, how do I understand my life? Um, you know, particularly among folks you know, who are in some way tethered to the, to the, to the writing world, um, you know, much of what you do is material. You take, you know, your life is material. You write about it. You think about it. But you tend not to think about it also in terms of how this could have affected you, yeah. how this could have shaped you. You're, you weren't a reporter, you know, just airdrop you know, to, into a war zone, and then we're able to to you know, get out. You you live that. Yeah, that's also why the first drafts of this were terrible. Um, also, I, I wrote an entire first draft that uh, I, I uh, of the first. Third, so it's three volumes. The first volume is about the, the 12 year old Glenn, and I gave it, I sent it to my agent, and she got back to me with notes. And after 45 minutes, she said, "Do you have any questions?" And I said, "Yeah, did you like anything?" And she paused and she said, "Honey, don't ever change your font." <laughs> <laughs> is it Garamond? <laughs> it's it's, 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 it's a, a, a wait, what is my font? A Courier New. Mm. Yeah, big, right? big, I like the big curve. But like, so I, uh, I had not made myself a character in the book. I was a floating eye. I was, I, I had that whole idea of being like a journalist, where you, you don't want to influence the reader too much by putting your thumb on the scale. No, you know, it turns out that in that more because uh, my friend Rob Spillman pushed me in front of the uh, Vivian Gornick book, the situation in the story. The idea is, as a memoir, what you really want to be is more than just a witness to your own life, but a participant in it. And readers want to have 
uh, a character they can either cheer for or you know <laughs> really not cheer for, or throw the book across the room. But they don't want to just have to experience the events on their own. They want to have a guide. They want to have a leader of some sort, and then experience feelings that might be transgressive. Um, you know, I, can I? Well, so yeah, go ahead. My a long time ago, my publisher said, "Can you come up with a one sentence description of your book?" And I thought about it for a while. I said, I'm going to go test drive it, and I did. And my publicist said, how'd it go? I said, not that well. Uh, I got hit. Um, cause the person I told it to slugged me for my one sentence. Okay. And so what I would just say about this is that the, the book is, <laughs> instead of this one sentence, <laughs> uh, when, I was, uh, when I was young, I kind of rescued myself from living alone by applying to boarding school and going off to this place called Thatcher. And that was the first place I tried to find a new family, and that's the end of the first section of the book. And this is in Ojai. Ojai, in beautiful Ojai, and there's people from Thatcher here. Uh, the second volume of the book is called The Counterfeit Child, and it was about my next attempt to form a family when I worked at an independent bookstore called Hunters in uh, Westwood, California. And one of the guys I worked with there had imaginary children, and the children started writing me letters. And this was about how I learned about being a fiction writer and about the importance of fiction, not just being, you know, the sort of clever thing we do, but like genuinely, in his case, it was a life-threatening situation and he was rescuing himself by throwing it into this imagination he had. And the last volume is called The Book of Revelation and it's about how I found the woman I thought I was going to marry roughly the same week my mother found her soulmate who was a uh, crystal meth addict uh, roughly my age, uh, he used to threaten to kill her all the time. Uh, my my relationship completely fell apart. Hers, just fine, all the way to, to you know to his death. And the at the end of it, I found a kind of autonomy. I realized, and, and I, I kept on hammering on the the idea of it being autonomous. So I was over at Tosca. I fell into conversation with somebody there who was another who was another artist. We had a really interesting back and forth and all that stuff. You know, oh, well, what's your book about? Well, interesting you should ask. I got a one sentence description of it. It's about how I learned it was wise to stop loving my mother. Pow! <laughs> she said, "If you don't love your mother, you will never have a satisfying relationship." Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good way to read the book. I think well, um, that's the thing. Yeah, but but. You could, I don't know if it, it would be quick on the draw, but you said asterisk. Yeah. Uh, I don't hate her. Right, yeah. Well, that's the other thing. Is like, it's, hate is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is compassion from a distance. It's, she's made her decisions, and I don't want to do anything that causes her pain, and I don't want to do anything that, you know, uh, that, that messes with her. It's like, she's made her choices, and I respect them. It's just, though, that I don't have that drive to be involved in her life anymore. So, as I've seen before, I mean, there's so much, again, there's so much in this book, it's, it's, it's one conversation is not going to do it justice. But I want to get back into more about the writing aspects, because there's something you're saying about how uh, you had to be more involved in your, in your telling, you had to be a character mm -hmm. in your book. But there was a, there's a part where you were talking about trying to write uh, fiction as an undergrad. And I think this would have been when you were in school back east, before, before you came out to, uh, to Cal. And you write... The more vulnerable I made my fiction, the more hateful it read. Hatefully read. There isn't much that causes people to recoil from more than sensing someone wants to be liked. So, so how do you suppose that is? <laughs> well, I mean, I think they reeked of desperation. Uh, in the case, I think that uh, there was no, there was no, there was no splinter of ice in my heart in that particular <laughs> case. It, you can tell when somebody is writing something in order to be liked and. Readers are incredibly moralistic on the page. I mean, much more realistic on the page than you are in real life. You know, you definitely hold characters in contempt if they seem like they're trying to get one over on you or like slip into your good side. You know, it's like a, so. Yeah. Speaking of contempt, let's talk about the clown joke. Um, <laughs> now, this is actually before we do. I just want to quickly set this up. This is a a, a, a part of the memoir where you're now in Cal. Yeah. You're living at a at a house. That for those of you who who know Cal, or you know, in my case, you know, just a little bit, sounds a lot like a co-op that yeah. you might find like a clone court or something. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's incredibly uh, a glamorous place. Um, there's all these things going on, and you're buckling down as much as you think you can buckle down to be a quote-unquote writer, right? You have a 
a poster of David uh, uh, Levitt, is it, <laughs> on your uh, on your in your in your writing room mm -hmm. because uh, Esquire had anointed him the voice of your generation. So, so I had to hate him. You had to hate him. Like right. screw that guy. Yep. Don't so you, you, you get down to writing, and what happens is that you write a um, a short story called The Clown Joke. I think if I have this right, that got a nice acknowledgement from a journal. They didn't accept it, but they thought, hey, there's something going on here. And you took that to mean I should develop this into a novel. Oh, that's it's very kind of you to think that anybody said anything nice about that story at any point. No, I wrote this in Leonard Michael's class. Uh, oh, about, that's right. And uh, at one point, uh, we, <laughs> I was reading it aloud, and I looked up and his head was on his desk. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, stop, stop reading this story. This is a bad story. He held it up like this. This is a very bad story. And he knew that I was that type of student <laughs> that needed that. So, of course, I turned it into a novel. But it's because at the end of that class, they're, they're kind yeah. of doing a debriefing. Yeah, at the very end, on the very last day, he went around the room and asked everybody what image they remembered most from all of the stories turned in class. And people send a lot of different things. And finally, someone said, "What about you?" And he said, uh, "What? What about you?" I can't get those fucking dead clowns out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, novel. Done. <laughs> and the uh, it, I only bring it up one because it, it amuses me highly because I think the conceit is clowns are washing up on the shore of an island. Yes, is that. So it's a terrible joke on the clowns. Yeah, the yeah. Whoever, how, and I was intrigued. I don't know why that is, but more importantly, um, it reminded me so much of all the bad writing one must do. Yeah, yeah. Before you get to a good place. Yeah, it's true. There, yeah, I had uh, I've, I had a lot of it, definitely. And I clung on to the bad parts, too. I was, I was not going to let that flotsam go down without taking me with it a few times. I have to say, one of the great charms of the book, and it is charming, it's very funny, too, is that um, it makes that part of the writing life seem incredibly, familiar, if not recognizable. There's no. Uh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, there's not people uh, hanging out, uh, you know, in a around these small in Paris trying to do something. There isn't this sort of, um, if you will, uh, unnecessary self torture. It's really how people become writers, which is you sort of stumble your way through. Yeah, I didn't think that was going to be part of the memoir at all. The writing part. But what happened? Uh, I kept on understanding. I was using it as a way of coping. Um, and it, time and again, it showed up in places where I realized, oh, because I wrote this, something changed with my mom, or because uh, uh, I was trying to shape my reality. And then also, it's where my ambition came from. And I think if you, when I did start to think of myself as a character, you ask, what does a character want? And what I wanted was to get published. And that was a big motivator for me. Right. So we have, I think it's almost uh, 7.50, so I'm going to open it up to uh, Q&A uh, really quick if I, if I can. If you guys don't have questions for Glenn, you won't hurt his feelings a little bit. But, you know, he's, um, you know, he's okay with that. Do you feel like, <clears throat> having lived in Southern California and in San Francisco, there are different parts of you that developed and, as a writer and as a person? With the dichotomy between Southern and Northern. So the question is, having grown up in both, is yeah. Uh, I I was walking through through uh, Los Angeles once with, with an old girlfriend, and she she started doing this thing where about every fourth person that walked by, she'd go, "Oh hey," and every one of them would go, "You know," because everybody in LA thinks they're famous. Um, and the thing is, in San Francisco, uh, everybody thinks they're soulful. <laughs> and, <laughs> is that a hiss? <laughs> Pow. <laughs> Pow, right. But like, I, th I think that there's, um, I, I didn't, when I, you know, I lived, down, I lived down on the beach most of the time when I was in, in Southern California at first, and that's got its own different culture, uh, definitely. But I, uh, I do think that what developed for me up here was a sense of history. Uh, a sense of community in a way that I didn't have before because everything's a lot closer together. Uh, and I think that when I'm down in Southern California, there is there is definitely uh, a focus on, on image that it first seems shallow, but it's not at all. It's because it's about your presentation of self in everyday life. And that turns out to be something very important as well that people in San Francisco really do secretly actually think about as well. <laughs> yeah. um, well I'd like to just 
say publicly again, I'm really proud of you. Thank you. And I think for all the underparented people in the world, uh, <laughs> those are important words to hear. So um, I hope I can offer you an authentic voice in, in saying that. Thank you very much. Um, but I was thinking also, because I remember speaking with you when we were first, first beginning to write this book, and I read your the interview you posted today about with Jane Shibatari about sort of making yourself into a character in mm -hmm. order to write yourself. So not just sort of a direct first person, but to see yourself as a character in the story. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you feel, how, how do you feel, if you feel any different from when you started this memoir to now that it's actually out there for public consumption, if the idea of yourself as a character or yourself has changed since the idea of publishing a memoir to actually having it be. So yeah, has my sense of self changed since making myself a character in the memoir? God, that's a great meta question. Because <laughs> like, they're like pull back mirrors and just like, yeah. Uh, I mean, what is, but how does it feel today having this book actually be... I have been an anxious mess on a level I've never been with a book coming out before. And in part it's because I feel very responsible for every word in it. Uh, being true, if not, you know, not you know, accurate but true, like it actually reflects things. And I feel like uh, with my other books, I've hoped to entertain. And in this one, it, there's like, you know, there's a point where I was waiting for a phone call from my editor and I was kind of walking in circles going, why am I so anxious? And then I was like, oh, I've just given Knopf my life story narrated by me in which I'm making judgments about myself and there's judgments about my writing and they're all, and also I've decided to make my writing part of the storyline, and I'm hoping that they're going to like it. <laughs> sure. And read it out loud. <laughs> and, I, and then I read it out loud, yeah. So, you know, it, there's an awful lot, you know, um, so when I was a little kid, uh, I had a coin collection, and my my, uh, my parents would do these whole co house tours of our giant 1969, like, you know, avocado green harvest gold house, and uh, the end of the tour would be me printing out my coin collection and doing five minutes about, you know, everything. And my mother was humiliated by this whole thing. She thought it was just like really awful. My dad thought it was great. And so for me, my worry about coming out with this is like, here's my coin collection, you know, this is my, my life. And that's the worst case scenario of the memoir. The best case is, hey, I got some coins too, you know? I mean, this is, you know, here's, here's my life as well. It's familiar to me. And that's what I'm really hoping for, and that's the character I'm hoping in there. I'm hoping to be a generous host, that there's room for everybody else and their stories uh, to get reflected in there. I think we all have relationships with parents and children and other people in family where it doesn't fit the normal narrative, and the way you feel about them is, is not the, the way that no, normally you get encouraged to have it. In the back. Uh, does the book talk about how you fall in love with comics? It does. It does indeed. Um, I, uh, I I read comics just as, as a kid, and when uh, during that time period where I was living on my own, uh, I just reread comics over and over again. And there was a magazine called Foom, Friends mm -hmm. of Old Marvel, mm -hmm. and in one of the issues of Foom, <laughs> Jim Shooter who is the uh, writer and editor on The Avengers, said he wanted to do a story that was 12 issues long that featured everybody in the Marvel Universe. And I thought, that's me. I can do that. <laughs> and so I wrote it, and I sent it in to him. And uh, he called. He gave a call back. And uh, he, the reason he called was because he had started in comics when he was 12 and 13. And he just kind of wanted to let me know it was okay to be thinking about that. Uh, but it was just enough of of a professional voice that it was uh, enough to get me going. He also told me to stop reading comics um, and to start reading literature and you know figure out how things work and he said, you know, come back to it when you're 20 and see whether you still want to do it or not. The comics will still be around. Yes? Um, I'm curious about the, the word that you have chosen to talk about your goal here is, uh, is autonomy. Mm -hmm. And this is the story of how you became autonomous. Um, it's an interesting word choice. So many people talk about fulfillment, self-realization, and you know, acceptance, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and I'm very interested in, on why you, you landed on the word autonomous when you were, were already independent. 
I don't know. <laughs> oh, Jason. <laughs> Jason, you broke everything. <laughs> you were doing apologize. so well. Apologize to San Francisco, Jason. Um, no, it's a good question. I think I, so when I was doing the book, I was looking for a word. You know, I was looking for something that I could talk about. And I kept, I, I had, had come across the section uh, midway through the book when I'm working at the independent bookstore. I fell in love. Uh, I was 19, and I fell in love with this incredibly exotic woman who was 26. Um, and one of the ways we bonded was in talking about Clint Eastwood, uh, who in an interview had said, someone had asked him if he was interested in power, and he said he was interested in power only as a reflection of his own autonomy. And I had to like look that up to understand what that meant. And so the word autonomy passed it back and forth between us as we were courting each other. And to me... There's a thing about knowing what you're responsible for and knowing your own boundaries that's contained in autonomy rather than just independence. I think, um, I think autonomy carries with it uh, an idea that you might be dependent on somebody or something else, but you still have your own, your own bubble with you. Right, so it's, it's, it's not autarky, it's autonomy. I mean, you're, you're your own self, but you know, clearly you, you know, help people, you do, you have relationships, these sort of yeah. things, yeah. but you're not, you know, literally an island where you're just drifting off, and yeah. where you're sort of like, well, you know, I'm Bruce Banner, <laughs> yeah, the Bill Bixby version, just, <laughs> just yeah. hitchhiking down the road. Right, yeah. So just to add on, is that a way to protect yourself, you know, um, given the circumstances of your parents separating and all that? Oh, I see what you're asking, yeah, is autonomy just like, a, is it a defense mechanism? Right. No! Um, <laughs> the feeling nothing thing, like, I probably would have thought, yeah, I'm autonomous, you know, but at the same time, I had insomnia and, you know, was, like, not able to really let people in. I mean, to me, I think that there's a, there's something you pass through, to, for me at least, to, to get to autonomy. And what you what I passed through before is like a level of codependency and uh, feeling. And you know, I did a lot of therapy. I did a lot of EMDR. I did a lot of stuff like that in order to get a little more calm about it. And what I think about is being able to be in relationship with with somebody or and, and with with people, and uh, but without immediately giving away parts of myself. Um, you know, without like trying to twist myself to be something different in order to meet that person's needs. I did that a lot with my mom, and uh, it's something that I feel like I only could stop doing that once I've left down the armor of I'm fine. Does that make any sense? So all these folks, they have important questions, but before they, we, I get to them, I want to ask you a frivolous one. Um, so uh, before I started the book, I skipped ahead to the uh, uh, acknowledgments, and then... Um, <laughs> as is my want, and I was intrigued by this very cryptic line, Barry slash Buck slash Mills slash Stipe. Guys, I am so sorry. So as it turns out, you have a very interesting relationship with R.E.M.'s music, uh, particularly one song. Did you, could, you, could you explain? Did you talk about that? No, I can't explain, but I can tell you that about 40 pages of the book has a heavy R.E.M thing going on in it. Okay, so this is the hard and it, so this is the hardest thing to write in the whole book because uh, it's genuinely inexplicable. Uh, in 1986 when Life's Rich Pageant came on, I was dating a woman that I was very close with and uh, we, <laughs> we it just it was just, it was the it was the summer that ecstasy became illegal and we got ecstasy and Took it and like we're waiting for it to hit, and then I got this phone call. Hi, uh, have you, you, haven't, you haven't taken that ecstasy yet, have you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. It's just it's uh, it's not actually ecstasy. It's we don't know. It's close. It's really, really close. But don't worry about it. You know, it's fine. It'll be fine. Everybody's having a great time on it. Enjoy. Click. You know. So. We, uh, you know, had an ecstasy trip, and uh, when uh, we put on this song, uh, Koyahoga, off that album, I have to say this, I don't think I actually like the song. <laughs> when you hear the rest of this, it's not as if, you know, I put my head in the pillow and I hear Koyahoga in my sleep or anything. It's just like, there was something about it that allowed me to see what she saw and what I, we, we shared, like, it was one brain, forearm, four legs, 
And then the next, you know, the drugs wear off and you go off and you have your own life. But that continued. Anytime she put that song on, wherever I was in Berkeley, I would call her. And likewise, like if I was thinking about a place, she would come find me and stuff like this. And then it faded after a while. But like, it was one of those things that like I could not explain and to try to write about it in a way is also really, is ridiculously hard to do because you have to get it, hey, you two kids really wanted that to be true. And it didn't really happen, only it, we feel like it did. So that's what that's about. And then, then there, there's a, there's a, I have to say this, if you are unmoved by this description of it, there's a pretty fucking good punchline to it. Yes. However, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good callback. It's a good, there's a good callback that, uh, that makes it all worth it. So like when I was writing that, you know, my, my people over at Knopf, they're, you know, like, like Moscow does not believe in tears. Knopf does not believe in psychic phenomena. You know? <laughs> no, no, no. Make sure you know, you know, right? But then they got to the end of it. They're like, yeah, okay, we'll give it to you. It's, it's, it's worth it. The Athens Georgia mind melt. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what that was. Okay, I just wanted to get that out of the way. More questions, please. Wow, no more. You don't have to, you know, but, but we can, you know, it's, that's cool. it's, I'll just, uh, I'll just say this also, by, by the way, when we do signing here, um, I, I want to tell people this story. Um, an early signing for, for my first novel, Car Beats the Devil, uh, I, 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 I blank out on, on faces often, and uh, a woman handed me the book, and I, I, she, I said, would you like this inscribed? And she said, yes. And I said, and what's your name? And she said, Glenn, I'm your stepmother. <laughs> <laughs> I said, can you narrow it down a bit? <laughs> <laughs> it was Anne, Anne the stepmother, was the one who handed it to me. So if later tonight, like I, you know, if I do that to you, it's nothing personal, I'm just an idiot. <laughs> she would have done the same to you. She would have. <laughs> <laughs> she would have. My, my, my stepmother is a wonderful person and she, has, she also has some interesting social quirks. And like, I, I, people who have read the book, who know her, have called me and said, Oh, you put the part. You, you put in the part about how when a guest comes over, she doesn't actually let them in. <laughs> like you know, your friend is here. Where is he? He's on the doorstep. <laughs> well, hey, if there are no further questions, um, let me just then say, uh, Glenn, thank you so much uh, for this this tremendous book. And, and so, congratulations. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you very much. And, um, thank you all for coming out tonight.